Well, the day started uh, a pretty hectic one because um, we had um, uh, an interview with Roy Plumley, who was the founder and organizer of Desert Island Discs, and that had been planned a long time ahead. And uh, we then had lunch together, and um, <clears throat> we um, walked out of the studio, and uh, in those days the uh, IRA threat was quite real, and so I had an escort who was supposed to meet me whenever I came out of anything, and he was armed, of course. And uh, I looked around for Corporal Thomas, and there was no sign of him. So I speeded up my walk and left poor Roy, t Roy Plumley trying to catch up with me. And I headed across the island, across the road. And as I reached the island in the middle um, of the road outside the broadcasting house, um, <clears throat> there was a, an Irish voice in my ear, which was the worst thing that could have happened. Uh, and it was Eamon Andrews, of course. And the voice said, Colonel, we need you. And immediately I swung my briefcase back to hit him full on with it. At that moment, right in front of me, was another figure I knew. It was the Chaplain General, um, Venerable Archdeacon John Newans, who um, was coming towards me. And I said, look out, Padre, it's an ambush, or something like that. And then Eamon Andrews said, no, 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 this is, this is, this is your life. And he held up this book. And suddenly it clicked what this was. And I said, where the effing does something have you done with Corporal Thomas? Of course, he said, no, no, it's been cleared by the Ministry of Defence. It's all right. Of course, they had to reshoot that scene because my language wasn't broadcastable. Well, my, my first thing was really security, I suppose. We were so geared up for that. And I was more concerned about Corporal Thomas. And I kept asking, where is he? Because there was a chap my escort wandering around, armed to the teeth, <laughs> and in fact he was all right, he was inside, and he was there with my wife. We, I think we may have gone into the studio at the start, and there were uh, rows upon rows of my young soldiers. When the, when the sappers arrived, they'd all say, where's the beer? And of course, they were told they had to wait till afterwards, and they weren't going to do that, they were all going to make off for the pub. And of course they said, well, no, 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 don't go, you must stay in the studio, you must stay in the studio, you mustn't go outside, otherwise they were frightened that they'd all see me. So in the end they had to open the bar to keep, keep them all in the place. I had seen the show previously, and so I knew roughly the format. I, I guessed that my parents, or my stepmother and my father would be there, and I guessed that, or Judith I knew would be there, was it my two daughters. I, I imagined that they would have waked up various friends of mine from the Scientific Exploration Society and Expeditions and so on, which is what they did. It was very nice to see the, the, the girls, uh, the various assistants I'd had or girls that had worked with me, who I wouldn't necessarily have expected all to be there, but obviously they'd done their research. Seeing Cliff Lekalanek, the um, Queenie, as I used to call him, was the, the naval officer. Um, that was, again, quite a surprise, because, you know, last I'd heard, he was somewhere on the high seas uh, on a ship. Corporal Crawley, for instance, was a big surprise uh, because um, I hadn't seen him for a very long time since we were together in, in the Sahara, in the desert, defusing mines. But all the time, at the back of my mind, was I was thinking, well, who is going to be the surprise guest? Because I hope it's someone I recognise. That was the awful thing that occurred to me. I perhaps they might have bought someone, and I thought, who the, who the devil are you? <laughs> well, <clears throat> The, the story of Charlie Thompson was that uh, he was uh, um, the descendant of the runaway slaves who were hiding in the jungles of Panama right at the time of Francis Drake. And they, were, they befriended Drake and, in his war against the Spanish. So they were sort of slightly pro-British. <clears throat> but that was, of course, years and years before. And when we were going through the Darren Gap, we reached an impasse where we couldn't advance and there was no way and that we tried this way and we tried that way and we were completely stuck, and the expedition really looked as it was going to be an awful failure. And there was a lot of publicity, and so we felt you know, the world was watching us to say, where are we going to make it? And of course, a lot of expeditions had failed. And um, rather depressed one evening, I went into this cantina in, in this little town called Boca de Coupe. We're having a beer, and this old uh, Negro came over and joined me, and. Uh, uh, he spoke a little bit of English, but 
very, very little. So we, in my half Spanish and his half English, and then we eventually got an interpreter. And um, after a beer or two, he said, uh, I know a way of getting over the pass in front of you. And I said, really, how? And he said, more or less, if you go up river, there's a place called Cruzamuno, which means monkey crossing, where the river is very narrow. And he said, if you can winch your Land Rovers up that slope, and it's about a 60 degree slope, you'll get to the top, you'll find a, you'll find a mule trail, and it's more or less flat to the border. So I sent a recce party off immediately to, to look at it. And they came back and said, well, if you can get the cars up that slope, it is possible. So Charlie came with me and showed me the best place. And he was the saviour of the whole thing, the whole expedition. And um, at that point, it started to rain, which didn't help, because the rains were not expected for another two or three weeks. And it belted down. And I thought, oh my God, that the rains have come early. And I turned to Charlie and said in my broken Spanish, is this the rains? And he, roughly what he said was, no man, this is just humidity. <laughs> and he fought down. Anyway, cut a long story short, we got the cars up the slope and over the top and eventually, of course, the expedition succeeded. So, of course, he features as a hero in the books. Uh, and he was, rightly so. And uh, that was it. We, we said farewell to him. We disappeared over the border into Colombia. And the expedition had been a success, but it was thanks to him. Now, uh, obviously, Thames Television had uh, researched this in the book, and they got hold of the Guardia Nacional in uh, Panama, who are the local police, who are a bit like the Tonton Macoud, uh, pretty tough characters. And they got the British Embassy involved, and they said that they wanted this Charlie Thompson. A number of policemen were sent off into the jungle to find this chap. And the story from Charlie was that he was sitting happily in his still where he made a legal booch and suddenly in came burst in two policemen and that was it, he thought, oh, I'm finished, now I'm caught. And they grabbed him and they said, Charlie Thompson, see, si, see, si, come with us. And they dragged him out and he had nothing but a loincloth on him. And they dragged him through the jungle to a helicopter and they said, and the pilot looked at him and said, Charlie Thompson, see, si, get in, no, handcuffed again. So he thought, oh my God, this is it. I'm going to be garroted in, in the main square in Panama City as an example. And he arrived at the military airbase in Panama, um, and to his surprise, he was met by uh, a diplomat from the British Embassy and a member of the staff of the Foreign Ministry. And they said, Charlie Thompson, is he <laughs> begging for anything? And the, 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 the Englishman said in Spanish to him, um, do you remember uh, some English people coming to your village some years ago, and apparently he said, no. And they said, well, do you remember uh, you remembered me? And he sort of, yes, he did. And uh, I said, would you like to go to England? Huh? Well, this chap hardly knew what England was. You know. And they said, if you would like to go to England to appear in a television show. Well, of course, he'd never seen television in his life. And so they had to explain this to him. And finally, he agreed anything but to get away because he thought he was going to be shot. And the foreign affairs said, we give you a, a, a temporary passport. And the British chap said, we give you a visa for 24 hours in England. And um, they said, do you have any baggage? Uh -huh. And he got his loincloth. So the, um, the, the embassy chap then apparently sent the embassy car down to the market with Charlie and some money and they bought him a suit and a floral shirt which you see him wearing there. And, a, and he had his, I think he had his original straw hat and I, I think he had flip-flops on, I, I'm trying to remember what he was wearing on his feet and um, so he um, was clothed and I think barely given a toothbrush and a passport and with that he, they put him on the plane and when he arrived in UK, of course it was winter, uh, pretty cold, having come out of the Darwin Gap where the temperature would have been in the 90s. And according to the story that I was told by the research girl from Thames was that she went to the airport to meet him. She said, I was halfway to the studio in the car with him when I suddenly realized he didn't speak a word of English. <laughs> oh, 
oh my god, you know, they'd all assume that he spoke English. So with that, they had, they had to sort of, they had so many hours to teach him enough to say a few words he said on the show. I think by that time they'd given him a meal and Charlie was quite a character and he was beginning to warm to this and he'd woken up to what was happening to him. And of course then, before the show, he met all these sappers and, and thought this is marvellous, all these idiots and lots of beer and so on. And I think that at that point, the Thames television staff were having a job keeping them all sober. Anyway, he took part, as you've seen, in the show. After the show, we had this incredible party, and we heaped presents on him and everything, and uh, he was very happy. And the girl who was running said, well, now I've, I've got to take him in the morning. He's staying the night in the hotel. We've got to take him back, get him on the plane back to Burma. Uh, and so back he went, and the next time I saw him was several years later. And I was on another expedition with Operation Drake, and I happened to go through his village, and I immediately, of course, asked for him, and sure enough, he was there. And I said, come on, Charlie, come and tell me what happened. And he said, well, the first thing is you must tell all the people in this village what happened, because they didn't believe him. They thought he'd been arrested for making illegal alcohol, and they, they would not believe him when he came back, because he came back still wearing his loincloth and nothing else to show. Because when he'd arrived back in Panama, the police had just stripped all his presents off him and everything. And they just put him on a bus, sent him down the road, and eventually he had to walk back a uh, considerable distance by walking a canoe to get back into his village. So he arrived back in the village just as he'd left in his loincloth and his hat, and no one would believe where he'd been. So then I had to tell the story to all of them, and of course after that he became the hero of the village.